I guess it'd be sometime today. Maybe tomorrow. Yeah, maybe if they're busy Wednesday. I would think it would probably be today, though. I mean, it's, it's such a big issue that uh, I would expect sometime today that the mayor and old lady Quinn Livin and others who support the new uh, shorter streetcar will have some sort of press conference saying that they no longer support it. I would guess that would probably be today. Well, I mean, I, I think I've laid out, with the help of the reporter from the Inquirer, uh, Barry Horstman, that uh, it's certainly ridiculous. No, no, even if you, the idea is you're going to expand it later, this shows that, that that stretch of it is basically unneeded. And it's not like the thing was 45 miles to begin with. The entire thing round trip was like seven miles. Funny thing, when he, when he walked it, it, it shows a breakdown of when he arrived at each place versus when the trolley car arrived at each place or would. Some of these spot to spot pick up to, to next stop. It only took him a couple of seconds longer than the trolley car. Just seconds. How could you still support this now? I mean, it was a bad idea to begin with, certainly in this environment in our poor economy. I, I have laid out compelling arguments all along, but now it's, it's actually heading into the absurd. It, it really is. When you can walk it like that, well, what about inclement weather, Doc? Take the bus. I've already laid out that argument in the past. Why would you build this when the bus is there? It's now getting into the absurd. And unless people like Mark Mallory and old lady Quinn Livin and others who supported it are now willing to admit it, it, they are either absolutely crazy, insane, off their rocker, time to be put in a rubber room, or their agenda becomes even that more obvious. Let's go back to the phones. Let's go. Uh, Dave in Mainville, you're on the big one. Good morning, Doc. Uh, a couple things right quick. Uh, you know, one might grab Mark Mallory by the earlobe and no lady Quinn living by the other earlobe, and march them one hour north, have a good look at Dayton, where for decades they have used electric buses, which are similar in nature to the uh, streetcar that they're proposing. And uh, they have dismantled that system up there in Dayton and gone to these buses that don't fit on their side streets. And so... <laughs> that way, that don't fit on the side street. No, no, they're, they're so big and wide, you know. And on these buses, I, you know, I don't have no idea what they hold. I mean, you know, probably hold maybe fifty, sixty people on there, and perhaps maybe two, three seats, or have someone in them. And uh, I, I, you know, I just don't understand where the common sense is. It just leads one to believe that maybe they're just trying to get some of them federal money and fill up their pockets before they get voted out. Well, that's it, David. Remember what I said. It comes down to if you want to get elected or reelected, you've got to build stuff above ground. Propose building stuff above ground or actually build stuff above ground because then you can hang your hat on it and say, look at what I built. It's a monument to me. And you can also get a bunch of different people who've been segregated by you over the years behind you because you claim it's going gonna, it's gonna to provide jobs for them. Whether, whether, no, you could break people up however you want. Certain uh, the types of, of laborers, uh, other businesses that may be involved, uh, unions, people based on uh, economic situations, wherever they live, uh, based on race, whatever it is. This has been used throughout the years. And you say, hey, this is going to create jobs for you. Well, most of these are not sustainable jobs. I mean, yeah, if you were to build a trolley car system, there would be construction jobs as they build it. But then most of the jobs they talk about would back off. Most of those would go away. And beyond that, it would be some engineers and some maintenance people to maintain it. But it's not that, you know, thousands of jobs that it's, you know, it's, it's made out to be. Those are all short-term, upfront jobs. And then you've got a bunch of people that actually have to operate it as well. So you create more workers when you could just say, we'll put another bus line down there. That's hilarious, though, that the bus doesn't fit down the side street there. <laughs> I've seen stuff like that other places as well. They're just so hell-bent on coming up with something else, something. Instead of saying, does the system we have work? What doesn't work about it? It's going after those dollars. Carlos, you're, how are you? I'm doing well, thank you. I'm overlooking Cincinnati right now at Eden Park, and I, re- I grew up in over the Rhine. And I remember the streetcar trolleys really well down by uh, 
music hall, and then going from there, tearing up the tracks and going to the electric overhead wires, going all over the city that way. Um, so, you know, I'm in uh, close to 70 years old, and I was just a little kid. I remember putting my penny out there on the thing and then watching it real, the car run over it and smash it down. You and know, at the time, mm-hmm. my, fam- my father was talking about, oh, you know, we need to get rid of the trolley cars. Uh, you know, they're such a waste, and they're so heavy, and they have all these accidents and so on and so forth, and we need to modernize. And that's what they did, and then they went to the electric car, and then they need to modernize again. Uh, I think we're throwing money out the window when we talk about the trolley car situation. Well, I appreciate your comments, but you brought up something I hadn't thought about. Maybe the mayor's plan, and old lady Quinlivan, the people who support this plan, is to give people another pastime. You know, taking the pennies out there on the track. Well, that's something fun to do, right? Maybe that's their plan. Maybe, maybe there's going to be a boon in businesses who will uh, support the penny smashing on track uh, industry. Maybe there'll be a huge, well, maybe they'll send you pennies. They'll sell you pennies that have already been smashed, stuff like that. You open up a little stop there, a little shop by, you know, where people get off. If you don't have time to wait here for the trolley car, we'll smash the pennies for you. Sure, there's all kinds of businesses like that. Maybe that's what they're looking at. Appreciate the comments, though, Carlos. Yeah, uh, of course. And if the world were to last long enough, this would be one where... 50 years from now, 100 years from now, 20 years from now, whatever. If they build the trolley car, people will be saying, we got to get rid of these things. Why don't we just go to buses? Buses can whatever. All the arguments I've made. And then 20, 50 years beyond that, people will be arguing in favor of the trolley cars again. Because it just gives politicians something to talk about instead of actually coming up with new ideas, things that could actually promote jobs and build a strong economy for the community. Instead of doing those things, They just go to the old ideas. Look what I built. You need to reelect me. Look at what I want to build. You need to reelect me. All right, coming up after the break, I've got some other really bad ideas from around the country. Things that are costing you money, even though they're not here. See, there's something to remember. When you hear about trolley cars built in other areas or other transportation projects, other crackpot schemes. We focus on the ones here, of course, in our community. You focus on those ones, and the bulk of the money in that situation would come locally. But there's federal dollars in it, and there was almost state dollars in it. So a lot of projects, transportation, infrastructure, they get federal and state dollars. So your dollars get dispersed around the country for other crackpot ideas. I'm going to share some of them coming up. 700 WLD. Next Monday's Memorial Day. Yeah, can you believe it already? Ohio's, of course, going to focus on their click it or ticket campaign at 410 this afternoon. Sloney and Tracy are going to talk about that, as well as seatbelt laws in Kentucky and Indiana. They'll do it at 410 today on 700 WLW. Oh, I hate the click it or ticket. I hate all that garbage. You're stupid enough not to wear a seatbelt. Oh, well, thin in the herd, done. Seems pretty simple to me. But, of course, we've got to social engineer with our laws, unfortunately. Another bad idea from around the country that's costing you a ton of money, HUD. The Department of Housing and Urban Development, HUD. This is the group that is primarily responsible for all of that public housing that is paid for with federal dollars. HUD. They have squandered, according to a new report, hundreds of millions of dollars on abandoned projects, this is, this is just relatively recent. This is a new report on projects just over the last decade. Hundreds of millions on stalled projects, ones they couldn't keep going, abandoned ones. They found out, according to the report, that, get this, that the local people failed to crack down on derelict developers. The local agencies uh, just kept funding them in some cases. Nationwide, there are about 700 Projects that were awarded $400 million that have just set idle for years. $400 million that a bunch of bad construction companies, bad developers, still got. Why did they get it? Well, that's the question. We're talking about fields where some apartment complexes were promised. They're still sitting empty. People are dumping stuff on them. Houses that were supposed to be renovated, that are boarded up, falling apart. In Inglewood, California, there was a group of uh, seniors there who are frustrated 
because they were promised a state-of-the-art housing complex four years ago. They got federal dollars. The city invested $2 million. The developer doesn't have the financing to go forward. So it's just stopped. So they gave him the money, but he doesn't have the rest necessary. So nothing happened. Your tax dollars at work in California. Two million of local funds plus other HUD funds. Doesn't have the money. Where's the oversight? Wouldn't you think that somebody would be there saying, well, let's make sure this guy can actually do it. And what is the consequence? If you're one of these developers, what's the consequences? Are they going to make you, how are they going to make you pay it back if you don't have the money? According to a Washington Post survey, uh, study, they looked at every major project currently funded under the HUD programs all across the country. 5,100 projects worth $3.2 billion right now. That's what's in the works. A little over 5,000 worth $3.2 billion nationwide. They did an entire year-long investigation, and they found an entire dysfunctional system. The entire thing is broken because it delivers billions of dollars to the local housing agencies, but it doesn't have any rules, or it has very few rules and then no oversight. So they take our federal tax dollars and they funnel it to the state or local agencies under this supposed altruistic attitude. Well, we've got to help everybody. Here, take the money. Again, taking the money from everybody and then redistributing it across the country as opposed to saying, listen, some areas maybe need a little bit more, a little bit less. Maybe their state should, you know, should focus on them. Maybe their local community. No. So they funnel this money to the local communities of the states. They don't have a whole lot of rules. They don't have safeguards in place. Certainly not enough. They don't even have a reliable way to track the projects. It's just throw money at them. Here you go. Here you go. Just sign in the checks. It, it is, it's an entire government agency that is acting like FEMA Act with Katrina. We don't know if you're from here. We don't know if you need the money. We don't even know if your house was hurt. Here you go. Take free money. Here's a card. According to the Washington Post, and this is not a conservative group. The Washington Post is not known for its conservative attitude. According to them, local housing agencies have given out millions upon millions of dollars to developers who are unscrupulous. Novice builders, people that don't have any track record. I'm a builder, give me money. Here you go. You ever build anything in the past? Nope, but I want to be a builder. All right, good enough for us. Here's your check. <laughs> people that have, have shown, a, a, that have a poor track record, showed that they can't build properly, irresponsible. People who have not built before, they've given money to nonprofit groups that are struggling themselves, who, again, have unscrupulous people who don't have a good track record, groups that have been accused of fraud and delivering shoddy work. This is who they're giving your money to. So first you have the attitude or the question of whether or not we should be handing the money to these groups. And what is the responsibility of government? And should we be building these developments for people who are poor? I say no. I say that based on a couple of reasons, but... Not the least of which is look around the country and look at the projects. Do they do well? Do they stay nice and pretty? Are people in them temporarily? No. It becomes a way of life. And then you just raise more people with the attitude of, hey, you too can live in public housing. But if you are going to give the money to them, if you are going to do this, then shouldn't it be done efficiently? Shouldn't we, the taxpayers, be getting out of it what we put in? Well, we're not. There's fraud and corruption, shoddy work, no track record, uh, giving money to people with no track record. They're not tracking these projects. The system has failed. They took a bad idea that's been proven year after year, decade after decade to be a bad idea that it just creates a culture of more people needing public housing. And it's not even run properly. They found in some cases, checks were cut when projects were still on the drawing board Without land, financing, permits, none of this. So people are like, I want to build it. Here's what I want to build. Great. Do you have land or financing? Nope. Well, here you go. Here's the money. 
In at least 55 cases, developers drew HUD money but left behind barren lots. Nothing there. Overall, one in seven projects showed a significant delay or a failure. Agencies, local agencies, they didn't even cancel bad deals. When they, when they found out that they were bad deals, that it was being delayed, that there was fraud, abuse, it wasn't working, they didn't even cancel them. Just kept on going. Giving them more money in some cases. They didn't even alert the federal HUD when projects were having trouble. They didn't even tell them, yeah, we're not going to be able to move forward with this. In fact, some cases they just went out and asked for more money. We're going to need some more money. Didn't tell them of the corruption, the fraud, any of the problems. But it gets worse at the federal level. HUD has actually known about all of these problems for years. It's known about its own failure and the failure of the local groups, but it hasn't changed its rules or even the requirements of what it takes on on the, on the local housing agencies. It hasn't changed that stuff. And even when HUD learns of a botched deal, here it comes. Federal law doesn't give the agency the authority to even demand the repayment. HUD, even if they cared, which it looks like they haven't, they don't even have the authority to demand repayment if it doesn't work. You and I, another $400 million down the tubes on a bad idea that had no oversight. Stock Thompson, 700 WLW. Over the weekend, I stumbled across a documentary on HBO. I think it was called the... The Motel Kids of Orange County. And uh, Kevin, if, uh, if we have a, we'll put a link to that if you can find it. I think it's the Motel Kids of Orange County. Just go to my blog, 700WLW.com, and you can check it out for yourself. I don't know if this thing was done 15 years ago or, or last Tuesday. I just stumbled across it over the weekend. I think it was an hour long. I only watched about 15 minutes of it. I came in late, and my head was about to explode, so I had to change the channel. Two things bothered me about it. And the basic idea behind it are people who live in motels and raise their kids there because they are half of the time homeless and the other half they they check into these motels. And there are some motels in Orange County outside of Disneyland where most of the people or a great number of the people in these motels are people who otherwise would be on the street, homeless people. And it shows them digging through the dumpsters as soon as somebody gets evicted and they're trying to get their stuff and, the, and how it affects the kids. And the kids are, you know, stuck inside the hotel because the, or the motel because the motel owner doesn't want to play in outside. Horrible existence for these kids. Horrible. Awful. And it shows the kids in school. Local school that was uh, privately funded. It's a charity and kind of like a, daycare slash school. I don't don't know why they're not in other schools, regular public schools, but ask the kids, what makes America great? Part of their lesson plan, they were learning about America. These were kids six through 10, let's say. They asked two or three of the kids, what makes America great? And I don't know if they asked 14 other kids and only use these three. I don't know if they only asked those three. I don't know if they prompted them. But all three of the kids, in their own words, said something to the effect of, because homeless people can get free stuff. That's what it makes, makes America great. That there's free food and stuff for, for homeless people or people who don't have a lot. That's what they've been taught. That was the first thing that annoyed me. It's not what it makes America great. That may be what, it make, what makes Americans great. But unless you're teaching kids that what makes America great is freedom and you have choices and you're not born into a feudal system, then you're missing the point. But the thing that really drove me up the wall, and it goes right along with what I'm talking about with HUD, with spending for the trolley car. There is a mom who has three or four kids in the hotel room with her. They were talking to her and she's saying how awful it is. And it was awful. I don't want to live that life. It was horrible. She was telling everything the kids have to go through. They just don't have enough. They're all cramped in this hotel room. How difficult it is. And then the interviewer asks her, 
How many dogs do you have? Four. She had four dogs. Four dogs. She can't afford a place to live, but she can afford the dogs. Animals are not cheap. Unless these dogs are out scrounging for their own food outside the hotel room, animals are not cheap. So essentially, she is putting time, money, resources in general into the dogs when she should be putting them into her kids. At that point, I was like, okay, I'm out of here. Time to change. Time to change the channel. If you can pay for those dogs, then you can pay for your kids. At very least, what little money you have should be going exclusively to your kids and not to the dogs. Paying for the dog. I saw a homeless uh, couple, supposedly homeless, with two kids panhandling about a year ago in Virginia. Harrisonburg, Virginia, they're panhandling outside of this large shopping mall. Right down the street, little sign, we don't have enough. Can you give us, give us, give us? They have two dogs with them, two huge dogs with them. New leather collars. They're, they actually had the dogs' dishes with them, those, those really big, nice dishes you have to go and buy. Why are you asking me money for your kids if you have those dogs and you're able to buy them dishes? Pay for your kids first. It's Doc Thompson, 700 WL. Your house underwater, you considered all of your options and how you can get out from underneath it? Well, a foreclosure may not be as harmful as you think. We talk to an expert on it at 1106 today. Find out what your options are if you're in that type of situation. 1106 this morning right here, 700 WLW. Denny, Indian Lake, hi there. Hey, Doc, you really hit a nerve here with this pet deal. I, we've got some people living here that, uh, I mean, these people are, their kids are on either subsidized or full free lunch and breakfast. Now, by your own admission, you've admitted you can't feed your kids. You shouldn't even have a gerbil. You shouldn't have a goldfish. There should be no tobacco products in the house, no alcohol. I'm sorry. We're paying your rent. We're paying for your AC. We're, I, this really hits a nerve with me. And, uh, you know, and some of them are truly, truly desperate, and, sure. and some of them are just third and fourth generation. They haven't seen a mom and dad get up and go to work and and draw a check on Friday, and it it really just galls me to no end, Doc. What what they're saying is, and this may be harsh, but what they're saying is these dogs are more important than my kids. Absolutely, they can feed their dog, but they can't feed their kids. The taxpayers have to feed their kids. That just, I'm, I'm sorry, Doc. This this nation on some of these things is just absolutely upside down. From when I'm 64 years old, and from when I was a kid, this is absolutely upside down from what it was. I saw a guy panhandle over the weekend with a dog. Oh. Same thing. I, I mean, it's all. In fact, you know what? You know what, Denny? Uh, over the weekend, uh, Lance and I were downtown taking part in a scavenger, and it was, a, it was a real good event. In fact, I think the sure. pictures are at uh, 700wlw.com. Uh, but when we were down there, we saw, I don't know how many, quite a few panhandlers. You see them all over. The signs, we'll work for food, we'll work for this, we'll work for that. And I was talking to um, a couple of my coworkers about it, and I'm like, there is a, a big difference between some of the people standing there and how some of them look. I mean, you don't know for sure just by walking by them, but you take a little look at them. What do their shoes look like? What about their belt? Expensive shoes, expensive belt. Sometimes you see, you see people with expensive shoes. Then you see some people that, whether it's just, you know, part of the image in order to fake you out, to trick you, or whether they really are that poor, have very little. We saw a guy that seemingly had all of his worldly possessions in kind of a makeshift backpack and he looked pretty serious about it but we know we've seen the stories about the people that pay and handle and that 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 are doing fine some of them making better money than you and i but it's really obvious when you have the pet with you so you and i can speculate well maybe that guy is poor maybe he isn't maybe he does need to help maybe he doesn't we don't know everything but if you have a pet with you and you're asking me for money you get rid of that pet first Speaking of the trolley car, uh, yeah, Kevin, my producer, kind of screwed me on this one. He should have had Barry uh, Horstmeyer on with us at uh, 9 o'clock. But he has managed to contact the uh, Cincinnati Inquirer uh, uh, reporter who walked the trolley car route, and he's going to be on with us in a couple of minutes right after the news. 10.06 on 700 WLW, the home of the